welcome to Bethany Community Church. It is so good to be live in the same room with so many of you all today. Um, I just ask you all to stand and worship. Uh, even if you're at home, you can stand and worship with us. Uh, let's, let's praise Jesus together this morning. I can see the promised land. Though there's pain within the plan. There is victory in the end. Your love is my battle cry. When my fears like Jericho build their walls around my soul. When my heart is overthrown, your love is my battle cry. Come for all my life. will move every chain of the past you've broken into over fear over lies we're singing the truth that nothing is impossible with you Feel the light. Your love is my battle cry. The anthem for all my life. Every giant will fall. The mountains will move. Every chain of the past you've broken into. Over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth.
If you don't know me, I'm Amy Mastriani. I work in the office here. Um, and I wanted to mention, if you're new with us, you can fill out a connection card. There's one in the back of the seat in front of you, or you can go on our website, bethanylaurel.org, and fill one out there. Let's go ahead, take a minute, say hi to somebody close by. If you're joining us online, join in on the chat. chat. Tell us where you're joining it from. Bobby, how you doing? Elbow. All right, let us go ahead and continue our service. I have a couple things I wanted to mention. There are a lot of different ways to serve around, and if you haven't found a way to serve, I highly recommend that you do so. Um, you can talk to me or one of the elders or connect with us through a Connect card. We'd love to join for you to join in on our service team. Uh, but I did want to highlight a few new ways that we've recently put out. Um, if you have interest in serving or skills with accounting or human resources or community engagement, we would love to hear from you. Um, we have a great place for you to fit in on our team. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is we're having people register for in-person, um, for in-person services. So if you're planning to join us next week in person, the link for that will go out tomorrow and you can you click there, you fill in your email. That's that. Um, last thing, bethanylaurel.org slash announcements is a great resource for all of you, for all of us. Um, that's where we put everything that's going on so you can check in. I, we can't mention everything from stage. That would just take way too long. And you'd be bored. So check in on the announcements page. You can find the stuff that really applies to you, and it's great. My wonderful husband updates it on a regular basis. Um, at the bottom of that page, you can sign up for our weekly emails as well, which is also a great way to stay in touch and know what's going on around. So please do that, because we want you all to be informed. <laughs> all right, let us move into our times of, our time of tithes and offerings. I'm so grateful for all of you who give, and it blesses this church and this community in huge ways. And really, if you look and see anywhere that we're doing ministry, your dollars are at work. Because um, it takes money to run all of these things. And I love the things that we're able to do. I love Cherry's children's ministry and all that they're able to do there and our Sunday morning services and our AV team. It all takes the tithes and offerings that we can give. And so it's just such a huge portion of this church doing the work that God's called us to do. Let's go ahead and pray. God in heaven, thank you so much that we are able to join together in worship for you, worship of you, in fellowship with each other, in sharing a common time where we are able to hear your word together. I pray that you would be softening our hearts as we go into the rest of this service, that we would hear from you in huge ways and that we would respond we thank you for all that you're doing i thank you for the tithes and offerings and the uh, the leadership 
stewarding those in ways that we get to engage with our community and engage with this church body. Pray that you would continue to give them wisdom as we steward those well. Pray for the rest of the service that it would just be sweet, sweet music to your ears. Amen.
be seated. Heavenly Father, we, we come together this morning grateful that there is an empty tomb. We thank you that you sent your son. We thank you that you loved us that much that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But Lord, we thank you that he didn't stay dead, that he rose. And Lord, that we have a living hope in the future of his return yet to come. So Father, now as we gather together in room and online and in every format that you've allowed us to have, we pray that your word might go forth. That you might be glorified in this time that we have. That your people might be edified, encouraged, challenged, so that we might continue to walk and be transformed into the likeness of your son. So now, Father, where I'm weak, be strong. Where I speak wrong, Lord, clarify words. Where I'm insufficient, so yourself all sufficient. Bless the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. Good morning, Bethany. It's good to be in the room with some of y'all this morning. It's been a while. It's amazing how... Sometimes you can take something for granted, forget you took it for granted, and then come back to realize just how for granted you took it. I kind of got used to being back in the room, forgot how much I missed it over the past year. And in the last four weeks, I've remembered all too newly how much I enjoy being in your presence a little more. We're going to continue this series this morning, and I'm excited about it. Um, because, one, I'm preaching through a series that in my life, I don't recall ever getting much of teaching on what happened with Saul before David. My, the most I believe what I recall was he lost his kingdom because he didn't obey God. But here we've been walking through a series entitled A Walk to Remember, Lessons from a King. And today I want to ask the question, really is my title, and that, that is, what prevents you from waiting? What prevents you, us, me, insert whatever term you want to put there. But what prevents you from waiting? I ask myself this question. I've been asking myself this actually a lot because those who know me personally know I am a hundred miles per hour. Even when I talk, I'm working on it right now as I'm speaking, trying not to talk at the pace I drive. Forgive me, y'all. <laughs> but as I was reading through this text and I'm coming into 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 6 through 14, I had to ask myself, what is it that prevents you from waiting? And it came with a subtext, when fear clouds the mind. When we look at Saul's life over the last few weeks, you've actually been getting more and more in-depth into how he came into his kingship and the process that that carried out and all that went into it. And then we come to a point where Saul now, we picked up in the beginning of verse of chapter 13, has now become the king. Last time we spoke, I told you about there were some people who um, God placed in their heart to go with him and some people that the Bible described as worthless. I want to give you some of the in-between. Immediately upon that, if you were going to go into the next section of his life, he immediately has to go into war. He has the call that the people requested of immediately become tested. There was this group called the Ammonites that came after the, the people of God, and he had to go and defend them. And when he did so and was successful at uh, saving the people from their enemies, some of the people that had stood with Saul said, let's go get the people who were the naysayers. And the same Saul that held his peace in that chapter comes out and says, no, nobody, whether they were with me in the beginning or not, will lose their life today. As time goes on, there's another enemy that arises. We hear more of this, these people or this group when we think about David. They're called the Philistines. 
Well, they are the next enemy that rises after that. You have the first battle, and then Samuel gives a whole discourse to the people, telling them all about how their request for a king was a rejection of God. We talked about that, so I kind of went past it. But then we have a new enemy that comes up. And this new enemy is a strong enemy, but the grace of God was still on the people of God. And in the first five verses of chapter 13, you see that the people of God prevail. But there's a problem. You see, sometimes when we face the first battle, we might win, but that doesn't mean the war is over. And when we get into this next section, what you find is that after, um, actually Saul's son is the one who defeats a group of the Philistines, and Saul sends out to all the people saying, hey, we've defeated the Philistines, but the Philistines do what any enemy does. They regrouped and came back with more people. See, the Bible describes about 30,000 chariots, about 6,000 foot soldiers showed up where Saul was, and now we have a problem. And that's where we get into this story. I want to read these 14 verses before I get heavily into it so that we all have the same context. When we arrive at verse 6, the Bible says, When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns, And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. He waited seven days, the the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offerings. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offerings, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And when Samuel and Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel. I want to take a look at this this sequence of events because there's a problem that results not from the enemy abroad, but from the enemy within. You see, when we read up in the verse 5, what we see happen is um, the people see something. The the Bible says in verse 5 that the people saw or Israel saw that they were in trouble. And the word there means to be distressed. And the first point that I want to give you is not even from that verse, but it does stand there as well as where I'm going to pull it from. And it's what Saul saw. So if you're writing notes, write down Saul, Saul, and then you can go and get yourself this question mark. What are you looking at? You see, the Bible gives us two places here where something is seen and there is a response that happens in both cases and both times. It's the wrong response. Up in verse 5, what we get is the people saw that they were in, uh, under distress. They saw that there was a bigger enemy coming, and in looking at the enemy, they stopped looking at God. So ironically, their fear of death or impending doom caused them to do some things that made me kind of chuckle in a, in a kind of cynical way. They're afraid to die, but they go and hide in tombs. Y'all catch that? They go and hide in places where the dead go to, go to rest is what the people do. But when we get down to Saul, what Paul says is the root of his outcome, which Samuel just gave him, Samuel saying you've done foolishly, started with what he saw. And sometimes what we see is not just what we see with our eyes, but it's how we perceive the situation we sit in. God has told the people that he's given them a king that will save them from their enemies. That's the promise God gave them. This is what God said about what Saul was going to do. He has already delivered them at least once with the Ammonites. He's now delivered them again from the first battle with the Philistines. But the first thing that they do when they see more trouble coming is run. It's interesting there because the people do that, but then when we get down to verse 11 is where I really want to take you, is what Samuel says when he finally encounters the prophet of God. 
You see, contextually, there's Samuel, who is the prophet of God. There is Saul, who is the king. The two have different roles. The two, the two have different responsibilities uh, in, in the nation and keeping of the nation. One is supposed to be the people, the reign over the people on behalf of God or in the presence of God. The other is the mouthpiece of God and the one who intercedes before God on behalf of the people. It's the one who does the burnt offerings, and God has given specific commands about how these things get done. And here what we have is when Saul perceives that Samuel hasn't arrived on the day he was supposed to, according to Saul, he gives an answer to Samuel here, and he does it in verse 7 when Samuel asks him, what have you done? The first thing Paul, Saul says in verse 11, it says that, and Saul said, when I saw the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash. I said, now the Philistines. I want to pause for a minute before we get too heavy into what he said to notice what he did. He said, I saw all this stuff, and it all sounds reasonable. He says, I see you didn't come when you were supposed to. I see that the army came, and they're going to come against me. I see that the people haven't stood with me, and it caused them to take an action that he was never supposed to take. And what I want to put to us is this. It's not just that he saw the army. He had just seen the army. He had just fought, or at least his son had just fought the army. It's his perception of his circumstance. You see, instead of looking and saying, the same God who delivered me before, the same God who called me to reign as king, the same God who designated me and talked about what would happen within me, I should have trusted that God. And sometimes we do the same thing. Saul doesn't trust God in this sense. He more or less trusts himself. Even though his actions say, I need to go before God, he steps out of what God had designed for him to do. And some of us do the same thing. I say that, I say us here, maybe I should be more personal. I do the same thing. You see, I found myself um, wrestling lately, a lot lately, with the concept in my mind of, Nate, who are you? Who are you? Do, are you? Are you all that God put in you from the beginning? Are you still being true to that? Or are you trying to accompany or... Um, be what other people want from you. Are you shifting? Are you the same fire that God gave you? Are you pacifying that fire because someone can't handle it? Or are you, are you shifting this way because someone doesn't like that way? And what does that do to you, Nate? Does it make you one who's kind of doing this, trying to make sure everybody can taste what God has given you? And what it made me ask myself was, when God called you, did he know what you were? When he called you, did he know that what was coming in front of you was going to happen? And did he call you anyway? And I found myself wrestling with it so much so that I would have conversations. My wife and I laugh a little bit about it now because around 8 o'clock at 9 o'clock, don't call me. About 8 or 9 o'clock at night, I go through the same process every night. My wife just knows it's coming. She'll be sitting in the, in the, in her, in the sitting room watching whatever the show is she wants to watch. And I'll roll up and immediately go into a self-evaluation stage. Where I start questioning myself, babe, did I do this right? Did I do that right? Am I this? Do I need to be that? Do I want to be what I have to be to do what God has called me to do? And it all stems from the same place that Saul makes his first error. What are you looking at? And what I found is we tend to look at the things that we don't find pleasure in much more often than we look at what God has already done. You see, when we look at this context, Saul doesn't look back and say, God delivered us from the Ammonites. He doesn't look back and say, we just beat the same enemy that's coming today. He sees people hiding and leaving. He sees an impending strike coming. And what he says is, because I saw these things, I took an action I never should have taken. And I want to ask us, what are we looking at? We just went through two years of a pandemic and we're still in it. And more often than not, we look at the negativity around what's going on. And I'm finding myself more and more wondering, God, what do you have me waiting for? Why are you slowing me down? I'm talking personal, so, so if it applies to you, great. I'm talking, I got to preach to me this morning. But it made me ask myself the question. And what I found is he's saying, listen, nothing that you think you're going to be able to do happens without me anyway. So don't run ahead of me. And I asked myself that as I was reading this, because that's the first problem that I see in what Saul's response is. He looks at everything around him and notice the Bible doesn't tell us he sees or reflects on anything that God's already done. And I want to challenge us that when things look like they're not going the way we want, when we can do the same thing Paul, I'm sorry, Saul does here, when we can look out and say, people have left me, some friends have, have left me, some people don't agree with me. When we can say those same things, when we can say, you know what, God, I was looking for you yesterday. 
When my family member got sick, I was looking for you yesterday. When, when someone else is in the hospital, I'm, I was looking for you yesterday. This morning before I came down the stairs, I saw a prayer request from someone in the hospital that was looking for God yesterday. And it's so easy for us to say, God, where were you when this happened? And God said, I'm still with you now. And I'm wrestling with that even today. So I look at this and I say, okay, God, what is it that we can take from Saul's action? And that's the first thing I see, a question. Are you looking at me or are you looking at your problems? Are you looking back at my promise or are you looking and perceiving the world through the lens of the things that don't seem to fit you well? And God's been challenging me in that and I pray that even now it's challenging you to look at things through the lens of what God has called for you. But it's not just that, that he saw something, it's also what he said in response to what he saw to himself. When we look at this passage, the next thing he says in verse 12 is my next point, is what Saul saw. Subtext, don't talk yourself out of God's plan. When we get here in verse 12, the Bible says, I said, now the Philistines will come against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offerings. Check what's going on here. Saul now seeing the problem in front of him and perceiving the problems so dire to his situation that he looks over it and then he begins to talk to himself. And that made me ask myself a bigger question that the Bible doesn't give us here but, um, in, in the same way, but it is here in the text. God initially spoke to the people through the prophet. He even speaks to Saul through the prophet. When we look over the last four chapters, you keep seeing Samuel talk to Saul on behalf of what God wanted Saul to have. But here, the only one talking is Saul. And it made me ask myself, who's your Samuel? Who's the person in your life that can come to you and tell you, thus says the Lord? Who's the person who can come into a situation and give you a vantage point of what God is trying to show you in the midst of a circumstance? Who's the person that you won't wait on because you see everything else? Substitute you everywhere I'm saying this for Nate. Because this is what the question became to me. It said, okay, when you're looking at the problems, do you begin to talk about them in a way that will lead you away from God? I might be the only one. It's okay. But every now and again, you'll, you'll see someone say something you don't like, and that person became a problem. That person wasn't the problem. The problem was you didn't want to hear what they had to say. I'm going to just start saying I so nobody gets offended. I started to see things through a lens that God never intended me to see them through when I talk just to myself. So-and-so doesn't like me because they didn't like an idea. So-and-so is not with me because we disagreed. Was so-and-so ever really a friend? Did they really care about me? Was I really called to this? Now notice God never said any of this. But when I'm looking at things the wrong way, just like Saul is looking at things the wrong way here, it becomes very easy to talk yourself into positions, places, and even movements that God didn't call us to. And I'm watching Saul go through this situation that's going to get him in trouble. Because when the end of this, I'm going to read a little bit further down from what I read here. And the consequences of his actions led to the first time God says, your kingdom will not last. We, we remember when he doesn't do what he's supposed to do later and God goes and calls David. But if we keep reading this text, it's here where God says, I had an established line that I wanted to work in your lineage and it's not going to go forward because of what you did here. And I have to ask myself, what, what might I cost my children? What might I cost this church if I don't stop long enough to see what God is doing? And this is what I've been asking myself for weeks. Like, this is not a new thing. But the problem is when you start, when you get into a space like Saul got, where you're trying to do what God said, but you feel the pressure of the world around you, you start to talk to yourself in a way that God has not designed for you to talk to yourself. That's why every time we look in the text of the New Testament, Jesus sent them out in pairs. He established community so we can't get here. Because every time we see Saul make a big mistake, it's when he's by himself. And notice here, the people have scattered, so there's most of what Saul is saying. He's saying in his own mind. He said it to himself. And I'm fearful that some of us may make the same mistake. That instead of seeking God and looking at what God is doing, and not just through the lens of the negativity, but also through all the things he's already done and is still doing and is still keeping, we wind up talking ourselves out of his plan. 
And that's what I see happening to Saul. Saul says, when I saw the people were scattered. Now understand, it's an interesting cycle of events because when Saul was called to be king, he hid in the bags. And when the people saw a problem, they hid in the tombs. And now Saul is looking at the example he laid in front of the people that they've now followed. And now Saul is going to step out of line of what God has said. Where do I get that from? Let's go down and here's my third point. Saul sinned. When Saul sinned. It's here in verse 12. I want to just keep reading down a little bit further here. 12 through 14. It says, I said, this is Saul speaking. Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have, sought, have not sought the favor of the Lord. It's funny how we'll blame that on God. He said, I ain't getting no time to pray because you weren't here. This is what he says to Saul, Samuel. You didn't come in time. We didn't seek the Lord. I realized it. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Catch what he just said. I knew I wasn't supposed to do what came next. How do I know? Because I had to force myself to do it. And this is what the Bible says here. And I want to keep going so we see the consequences of that action when Saul sins. The Bible in verse 13 says, And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with the, which, which he commanded you. For, what, for then, if you had, is the context here, for then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Catch this. All of the rationale in the world did not appease God in this situation. When we look at what Samuel is saying to Saul, in light of what Saul has said to Samuel, Saul, Samuel is saying, all your justifications don't matter. Saul is saying, I did this because we needed to seek God and you weren't present. Samuel is saying, had you waited, I would have arrived and everything God said would have been done. You didn't do this because you were worried about, you hadn't sought God. You did this out of fear of what was coming your way. And some of us do the same thing. Some of me do the same thing. All of me has done this. I don't know how some of me did it. <laughs> at one point or another, I've done this. I'm looking out at the scene in front of me and I'm saying, God, you know, I know how to get this done. And God is saying, I didn't ask you how you would get it done. I have a way to get it done and I need you to stand still long enough for me to do it. And I wonder here what Saul is thinking, because notice, Saul doesn't immediately lose the kingship. If we were to go forward in this text, what you'll find is Saul now follows the prophet to Gilgal. He wins the battle. But here's the funny thing about it. The prophet told Saul to go to Gilgal from the beginning, and he just waited. God would have moved, and the people would have come back. Because I, I had to read this like four times, y'all, just to let y'all know. Because it messed with me, because I realized something. There isn't really a time where Saul didn't threaten the people when they showed up. But every time Samuel came and said, God said, come, all of them came. So even when they were scattering from Saul, we have case after case that when God sent Samuel, the people came back. Saul didn't move because he hadn't sought God. Saul moved because he was afraid of the Philistines. And some of us are so spiritual. Some of us can get so into our, we, we got all the answers. We're blessed and highly favored. We, you know, God has got it. And we say all of that good stuff. But when pressure comes, we don't stop to even seek God. We just hope that the end result is what we hope God might have said. But we don't seek him because what would, I imagine, I try to put myself in Saul's shoes. And I think so, oh, if God had said, wait for Samuel, I wonder how Saul would have felt in that moment watching the Philistines show up. So he took Saul, Samuel's place. God didn't call him to be prophet, priest, and king. He called him to be the king. And some of us are trying to be too many things that God didn't call us to be. Sometimes I'm doing too many things. And God is saying, Ed, I called you to do this. I called you because you are this way, not in spite of you being this way. I, I, I sent the people around you and, you, and you're so distressed by the people that may not get what you, may, may not agree with you, maybe don't like the fact that you wear jeans, maybe don't like the fact that you like the hoodie preacher for the last four weeks. 
You're so caught up in that, or, or you're caught up in the fact that you like wearing suits from time to time, and when you do, people kind of make snipes at you and, you, and you're so worried about what they're doing that you lose track of what I said. You is absolutely me, y'all, so just, just put mirrors up, because I'm, I'm preaching to me right now. And God's been wrestling with me. I feel like Jacob right now, where God has been saying, I called you as you were because I had a plan that only I could do with the way you were. But if you try too much to be something you're not, you're going to mess up my plan for these people. You, Nate. And as I look at Saul, I find myself looking at Saul and saying, I don't want to be Saul. Saul was called by God. God initially called him and he said, is there any other like him in the land? He called him in a unique place. This man was like a giant among his peers. He was tall. They said it was about a head length above shoulders. You could identify him for his distinctiveness. But by the time all is said and done, Saul started to look just like every other king. And Nate's not a king, but Nate is unique. I got to say it like that so nobody hits me with an email later. I'm built the way God built me, and I have to accept that. But you know the hardest thing for some of us to do is accept that God made us the way we are. And that he planned a path for us knowing the way we were. And if we would just stop and wait long enough, he will fulfill what he said he was going to do. Saul was never in jeopardy of losing this battle. Because if he had, God would have been the one that was wrong. God said, I I gave you a king and he will protect you. He will defend you against your enemies. An enemy arises. If God is the one doing the protecting, then there was never a doubt that this battle was the Lord's. And this isn't the celebration uh, message. I know because for me, it's been pretty sad. I felt pretty, um, it, didn't, it don't feel good when, when God starts talking back at you and carving you up like somebody's birthday cake. But lately, I've been finding as I walk through Saul's life, all the ways that leaders fail. And I'm finding a consistent pattern in Saul's life that led to his fall. He relied too heavy on himself. And it's my prayer that as we examine the life of Saul and as we go forward and we see what Saul saw that we, so that we know how to look at what God puts in front of us and that we reflect on what Saul said so that we know not to talk ourselves out of God's will, that we won't end up in the same place that Saul did in our sin. His sin had consequences for the whole nation. His sin led to consequences for his sons. I mentioned a name earlier, a man named Jonathan. Um, some of you may remember him as being one of the best friends of David and David's kingship, but recognize something. The kingly line could have gone from Saul to Jonathan. But Jonathan dies in a battlefield because of what happened here. Because of what happened here, he couldn't be the next king. Now later on, we're going to find out that God does a distinct thing and pulls the kingdom and anoints David. But God told Saul right here, your kingdom, your monarchy, your lineage will not go forward. And it all started here. So I asked us and I asked myself, what are we, what is preventing us from waiting on God? Is it the fear of the circumstances around us? Is it the expectation that we have for ourselves? Is it that we're just so used to doing it on our own because things have tended to work out? And I'm calling on us not to walk ahead of God, but to sit and wait for his presence. You know, it's funny, a lot of churches right now are, I think this is Vision Sunday for a lot of churches. If you go on the web, you're going to see it's Vision Sunday. And the vision this year is pretty clear in my mind, and that is that wait on God. In one word, is sanctify yourselves. This is not this message, but I want to give it here because I feel it right here. One of my favorite biblical characters is the man named Joshua. Joshua was a transition after Moses into leadership. And God told him, be bold and courageous knowing he was about to go into the promised land. But if you look at Joshua chapter 3 at some point, the first thing God tells him to tell the people is to stop on this side of the Jordan and sanctify yourselves. He says, before I do wonders among you, you need to dedicate yourself to me. And some of us have gotten used to coming to church. Some of us have got used to checking the box. And God says, I don't need the box, I need you. And that's what this year is. I think he... I'm not saying the pandemic was for this purpose, but I believe there's a benefit in this purpose that we stop and dedicate ourselves again to the Lord, not to our practices, not to our processes, but to God himself. Because I believe if we can do that, then when we see things that don't look right, we won't get distressed. 
We won't say things that go counter to his word. And then hopefully it'll keep us from sinning individually or as a church. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time that we've come together. Lord, I thank you that even when your word doesn't feel good, that it's always fruitful. I thank you that even as we wrestle with what this means for us, Lord, you might place in our hearts a vision that desires to be in your presence. A heart that desires to worship you both in secret and in mixed company. A heart that makes time for you, time to pray, time to listen. Time to get to know you better by reading your word. Lord, I pray that as you sanctify us, that we might go through the process of sanctification will. That we might lay aside the things that weigh us down, the, the sins and the weights. Sometimes the relationships, sometimes the things we just enjoy. Lord, that we might lay aside the expectations that we have that you didn't give. The desire to please others more than we want to please you. Lord, I pray that you might purge our hearts. That we might make room for you. That as we walk forward in this journey, as we walk forward in our walk, that we might walk forward, not ahead of you, but Lord, following you. Lord, your word says that even before we came to the knowledge of who you were, you sent your son to die for us. And Lord, I pray now that we might recognize what kind of love it took just to do that. That before we would step out of your will, before we would uh, see things not as you saw them, say things that you didn't call us to speak, do things that you didn't call us to do, that even in those places you still loved us that much. Lord, I pray that in the midst of that love that we might recognize that your son came and died for us and that we might celebrate that he didn't stay dead. But as your word says that he rose on the third day. Lord, we thank you that he didn't just rise and stay on the earth, but that he ascended to your right hand. And that as Paul told the, the church in Thessalonica, that we can look ahead to a glorious reunion when you return. So Lord, I pray now for the person who doesn't know you. The person who doesn't know you for the forgiveness of their sins. Lord, I pray now that you might speak a word into their heart. That you might call them, tug them, press them, allow them to feel your presence wherever they are. And that right now, whether it be in the room or whether it be in their homes, that they might make a decision that you are Lord. That your son did die, that he did rise, and that because of his death, burial, and resurrection, we are redeemed. Lord, I pray for the person who has decided to follow you, but they saw something, they said something, and then the result of it was that they walked away. Lord, I pray that they might return to you. And in that return, Lord, I pray that they might be connected with other believers so that the souls in our lives might have Samuels and the Samuels might have souls so that we might together fulfill the purpose that you have for us. Lord, I thank you for the time. I thank you for your word and I thank you for your son. In Jesus' name I pray and give you thanks. Amen. I pray that that word blessed everybody or at least challenged you in some way, shape, or form. And I pray that as we move forward, that we might move closer to God so that we learn to wait on him. May the Spirit of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with each and every one of you. God bless you all. Have a blessed day.